afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for your patience. Um, a very warm welcome to this afternoon's talk. Uh, my name is Adrian Friedley. I'm here as chair of the Yorkshire and Humber Contemporary Visual Arts Network. Um, and we're delighted to be uh, putting on this afternoon a conversation between Mark Daly, founder of Future City, uh, curator of the CSI project and editor of the film, and artist Richard Wilson. Um, and they're going to be in conversation for um, about 45, 50 minutes, and then I will be the infamous roving mic and we'll take questions. And we probably need to be wrapping up around about 5.30, but um, a full and uh, very exciting package uh, to look at. Two things I should say. Firstly, a very uh, warm thanks to the whole college for being our hosts. And secondly, there's a, a fantastic exhibition of work by architecture students um, from years one, two and three um, in the exhibition area in the School of Art and Design. If you have an opportunity at the end of the talk to go and have a look at that, or indeed um, uh, later on, uh, I would recommend you do. It's a, a, an excellent exhibition. Um, and compliments very well. My final point, um, this is all in aid of Holsbeard for UK City of Culture in 2017, um, and one of the uh, key projects and indeed themes within that is the fantastic architecture of the city, so the exhibition um, uh, in School of Art and Design is very timely. Without more ado, I will hand you over to Mark, who will take us forward. Thank you. So what we're going to try and do is uh, split the talk into two sections, and the first section will really look at some of the key works from the last 10 years of Richard's um, output. We've got some films, we've got a very complicated setup here where I have to sort of shout to the back and then films are shown, so it probably won't be beautifully smooth, um, but if you can bear with us, and we're going to mix slides and films. In the second section, we're going to really look at uh, Slipstream, which will be, I think, Richard's largest permanent work. Um, uh, uh, 70 metres long, 70 tonnes, uh, being seen by 20 million uh, people a, a year at Heathrow's new Terminal 2. And perhaps we see if we can find some links between what uh, he's been doing in previous projects and what we're going to see, see next. So um, let me just introduce Richard. Um, so over a career spanning more than 25 years, Richard has built an international reputation as one of the most inventive sculptors of his generation. Internationally celebrated, the past 10 years have singled out for his concentration on ambitious large-scale architectural interventions and site-specific projects, drawing heavily for inspiration on the world of engineering construction and combining a love of low-tech and high-tech disciplines. Uh, Wilson has represented Britain in the Sydney, Sao Paulo and Venice Biennials, the Yokohama Triennial, nominated for the Turner Prize on two occasions and awarded the prestigious DAAD residency in Berlin in 1992. Um, Wilson's installation 2050, a sea of reflective sun foil, permanently installed in the Saatchi collection, was described as one of the great masterpieces of the modern age by the art critic Andrew Graham Dixon. So, we're going to look first at, this works, at uh, Slice of Reality. And this sculpture was one of many commissioned as part of the Millennium Celebrations in 2000. Uh, Richard described the work as a celebration of the merchant shipping that used the Thames for centuries. And it was intended to continue the line of the Greenwich um, Prime Meridian as though the line had itself sliced the vessel. The original ship was reduced in length by 85%, leaving a vertical portion housing the ship's habitable sections. Um, in his top 10 UK sculptures, the observer, architectural critic Ron Moore said he would have selected turning the place over, but as that had been switched off, he said that uh, he would offer the slice of reality, which he describes as the middle part of an ocean-going sand dredger, sliced, as it says in the title, like a piece of cake. He says, moored in the, in the Thames off the Millennium Dome and the Greenwich Peninsula, precariously perched on the mud, slowly rotting and quite beautiful. So the question uh, I wanted to ask you on this one, Richard, was um, there, there is a story that when the, uh, when the sculptures were cleared after the, at the, in 2000, that only two remained, and one of them was uh, Anthony Gormley's Quantum Cloud. <laughs> And the others were yours, was yours, and that was because it was in the river and they couldn't take it away from you. Well, in true? part, that's absolutely true. What happened is, as a payment for participation, there were nine artists altogether, and as payment, as participation in this 2000 Millennium Exhibition, uh, we were offered our work back at the end of 2001, uh, or at the end of the 2000. 
into 2001. And um, the uh, authorities at the Dome asked me what I would be doing with my piece of work and how I was going to remove it, which I saw as a major problem. Uh, but then working out that it wasn't actually on their property, I said, I don't think I will be moving it. I think I'll go and have a word with the Port of London Authority and see if I can keep it here. Um, which they realised they couldn't do anything about. And I was successful in buying a perpetuity licence, and the piece is still here today. And I ran it for four years as an office, and I ran it for about eight years as a drawing studio. My son ran an illegal club <laughs> for a year, until I found out. Uh, and now I just use it for parties in the summer. And the second question, um, <laughs> as we will see in, in some of the work, uh, you have a spectacular ability to find scrap. Or, but not the scrap that we might think of as a small piece of car in a, in a scrapyard, but a, a yeah. ship, a plane. How, how, do, how do you go about that? Yeah, well, it's interesting because, first of all, um, it's, they are, rather than scrap, they are dis disregarded objects, you know, be they buildings, aeroplanes or ships, but they're man-made structures. I play around with predominantly architecture, but also other man-made structures, so, you know, aeroplanes and vessels. Um, play a part in that. In this instance, I, you know, I'd never bought a ship before. Um, I went down to Portsmouth to see a guy called Ari Pound, who ran, ran Pound's Shipbreakers, and he told me about this particular vessel that was up in Stockton. So I went up to Stockton and looked at the vessel and thought it was a very ugly ship and wasn't really interested in it. The only thing that was going for it was it was a 600 ton sand dredger and there wasn't anything else in the UK being broken at that time and I was on a deadline to find a vessel. So in the end, a deal was done with the owners in a car park of a pub on a rainy lunchtime up in Stockton where I was actually bidding for it alongside uh, a team called Prosser's Breakers. They were scrap dealers. And I phoned Prosser's and I said, listen, don't bid for it, I will, but I'm going to give you the ship. What I want from you is the slice as a as a rough cut section, which we would then have stiffened. And so he withdrew his bid, which meant I could bring the price down because there weren't two people bidding anymore. But and do from you... that, I could get it cheaply. <laughs> and now, but now, obviously, people see you coming. So, you know, if, if you're the next... <laughs> so if they, you want a plane or the next like, a submarine on the next project, I mean, do you, do you now have to send in sort of representatives? Or well, you... not, not everyone knows my reputation, so it is still possible to go and seek these things out, albeit in the UK or in Europe. Um, and of course, one has to cut the coat to suit the cloth. You know, you might look at something that's far too expensive, then you've got to go elsewhere and find what you can actually cover with the budgets that you have in order to make the piece of work, make the installation. And then I, I just put this slide up. It's one of the, I, mean, I think there's a question later on about this, but what's kind of interesting with Richard's work is the way he mixes so many different disciplines. So he, you know, we work with architects, engineers, he draws and paints, he makes models and so on. But also his work, because it's so big and it's temporary, is the way it's, it's kind of the viral nature of it. If you, if you Google um, 2050 uh, or, or Slice of Reality, you get page upon page upon page of images where obviously people are sharing this material. You go to Flickr and you can find it. So it's kind of interesting in a way that your works, that seems to be the right work for the, the age we're in, the age of Flickr and uh, tweeting and, and so on. Have you come to, do you feel that? Yeah, I mean, I'm not great on that technology. But I think what it is, is where I, a certain aspect of what I play with is the notion of spectacle. And because of the kind of kit that's available nowadays for people to witness stuff in the street, you know, you can, you can see something, you go, my God, you can click it, and you can immediately send it to someone and say, guess what I've just seen. And it's, it's not so much I'm doing it for that kind of technology, it's because I do things which are structurally daring. <coughs> or uh, do have a sense of spectacle and take that immediate kind of showmanship like wow factor and I think that's very handy for that kind of technology that technology deals with that instant looking very very conveniently so it can be <coughs> sent off and, and therefore you have a lot of things where you know they do end up on say YouTube or on the Google uh, sites. Okay let's go into project number two is 2050 it's the only permanent installation at the Saatchi Gallery. It's been continuously shown in each of the gallery's venues since 1999. <coughs> um, the current version is on display in Gallery 13, was installed in 2010 uh, in a room that was custom-built for the, for the piece. Um, 
if you've not, if you've seen it, it's a quite extraordinary work. Uh, I went went to see it with my son, um, and we walked in and we were looking at the space, and he essentially said, "Well, but what's all the fuss about?" I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "Well, you know, where is the sculpture?" Uh, and I said, "Well, th th this is the sculpture." It hadn't occurred to him that it, this oil that's so still and so mirrored was actually reflecting the room. It, it's such a, a, a complex kind of installation that you, if you don't know what you're going in to see, you see what you see is space. Mm. Um, again, how, how did you come about the work? How did that piece start? Um, I, I suppose a lot of ideas come through many varied notions, but the strongest one here was, again, playing around with architecture. I wanted to try and make a space that you thought you knew, but in fact was something else. And the best way to describe that is if you think about the TARDIS in Doctor Who, you see a police box and you think you have an, well, you have an assumption of the space inside that box. And then in the programme the door opens and change of set. You're in a great big room, bigger than what the external parameters of the, the police box tell you. So I wanted in some way that kind of spatial conundrum. I wanted in some way to do that in a gallery space. And I therefore realised there had to be a certain sleight of hand by that a certain sense of reflection and mirroring to try and make the space much greater. But it only came around through a happy accident where I had oil in the studio which I'd been using for annealing some steel and I could never get rid of this stuff and it just sat in the corner and accumulated rubbish around it. But it always remained as this perfect black hole. And I thought one day, what about just flooding the place with oil? And what's so lovely about that is that Number one, oil isn't a, generally regarded as a, a, you know, part of the sculpture's vocabulary for materials. Uh, but, the other hand, on, uh, uh, but the other thing that excited me was, in fact, it's a hazardous waste material. Um, that, you know, if you poured it down the drain, you'd be arrested. But here, you could use it and people would start talking about it with notions of beauty. So it's a way of transforming the room and using a material that's been through its own transformation, I suppose. It's transformed uh, quite a few rooms, isn't it? And, and you've yeah. shown in UK, Japan, uh, America, Australia and Kurdistan, and I, again I wanted to ask you, you know, in some cases the spaces are created for the piece, but in some cases you've taken over spaces that exist already, haven't you? Um, what, what would you say is the most impactful work? For you? Yeah, well number one, the, the prime rule I try to explain to museum curators is that the piece gets made and put into an existing room, you do not make a room for it. However, there's been two instances where that has in part happened, where false walls have been put up only to contain it in a space so that other artists can share the, the, the largeness of a room. Um, but I suppose my favourite one has to be the first time I saw it, which would be Matt's Gallery. <coughs> However, the largest one that had the most impact for an audience was the first time at Boundary Road in 1991, which was, um, oh God, I've forgotten the number of gallons, thousands of gallons poured into the into this space. Uh, I don't know if we have a, a picture of it, but it's, um, <coughs> is that, is, that's the situation there. Yeah, so it's the whole of gallery number five at Boundary Road, the old Saatchi gallery, because Charles Saatchi bought the piece of work. And that, and, and that was something in, its, in itself, wasn't it? Because he, built, he bought an installation, which was actually <coughs> quite an unusual thing. Then. Yeah, well, it, it kind of opened a lot of people's eyes, because people said, how do you store it? How can he remake it? And I just thought this was common sense. You don't store it. You get rid of that one and you build another one. I mean, it's, it, in, a, in a sense, it's like a lot of the architectural work. It's an event. And what you do is you never repeat it. It's always very different. In fact, it's not a site-specific piece of work. I've argued with critics about this. It's not necessarily site-dependable. It can travel around anywhere. If I get a phone call and, it has, and someone is interested in showing a piece of work, I'm able to go and look at that space and say, yeah, I think it will fit in here. I will do the design work, and then the piece gets constructed in that space. Once that's been and run its course for an exhibition programme, it then gets destroyed and chucked away. I could not believe in 1987 when Charles bought it, the number of people who couldn't believe that you chuck something away and build another, or that you could have two existing at the same time. So it broke a lot of boundaries at that time. And again, you know, I, I put an image in after each of these set of, of just going on. That I found six pages, just un, unending numbers of these images yeah. being photographed. Well, it's been the party piece. I mean, it's my calling card. I, I go to functions and people say, that's the oil man. 
<laughs> um, I'm going to miss the. I'm just doing the back. I'm, we'll miss the film on this one, and we'll just go on to the next the next set of slides. Um, so this one, this is butterfly. Um, again, you know what might be considered a precursor to uh, slipstream. Uh, in the so degree, yes. Yes. Same family. Yeah. Uh, uh, you purchased a light <laughs> aeroplane, as you do, and you crushed it into a cube, and you moved it into the Wapping Project, which is an industrial power station in London's East End. And then you unpicked the cube over the course of the exhibition, uh, so that the plane, the reimagined plane, emerged, um, and you documented the whole process. Um, was this the, this was the first time you created a, a work of this kind in public, wasn't it? You did the work in public. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't intended as a performance. The 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 way in which the piece came around was that I I knew by two thousand and three. I mean, you were very kind. So I've been making work for over twenty five years. I've been making work for nearly forty years, actually. Which I don't like to make too much of. But um, I just began to realise, like a lot of artists, that it's very easy to, to know what you can get away with. Especially as you get older, you think, mm, OK, they want to show, I know what I'll do, I'll do that, it always works. Well, the thing is, that's when you start to get lazy, and that's when the work starts to look lazy. So I really was looking for a way of reinventing my vocabulary. And it came through, you know, I wanted to get back to the, the, the base, the, the simplest creative act I could come up with. I'm going to show you some, well, yeah. so I'm going to show you some photographs for us. Just, just talk against them as well as we go through. I mean. Yeah, so what, what I did is I, um, I accidentally washed the fiver in my jeans, and when I found it, I started to unpick it. And I realised actually that was the key to this new work. That you're not, you never get instruction on how to do that, but there's a, a sort of a intelligence that clicks in that tells you do that until it takes. So I realised I, I, what I could do as a piece of work was to take an object and crush it, put it in the gallery, and spend X number of weeks pulling it back out, not knowing the result. I mean, normally you, you work towards a result. That's the one that, that's and that, that's the piece of work that arrived at Wapping. And for three and a half weeks, I worked with a team of students from the University of East London. We pulled the aeroplane out, not really knowing what to do. And then it was only through the happy accident of having cameras documenting every five minutes the process that I suddenly realised what I was doing is I was actually compressing time. Having compressed an object, I was now, I was now sort of downloading these images every night up to a big hard drive, because there was so many of them that in actual fact the piece of work was the film. So at the end of the, uh, the time it took to unfurl the aeroplane, we cut the straps and everything else, let the plane crash down to the floor, overnight built a big screen 16 feet by 12 feet, and then the next day when people came in to see progress with the aeroplane, it had gone, it was like hidden behind, and there was this film display. There's a, we've got a short film, we'll run that if that's okay, and while we're waiting for that to go on, um, what was interesting about this project, I think for me, was the, again, this mix of um, drawing, models, film, music, science, and you describe the project, you describe yourself as the conductor of the opera, so you obviously like working with these kind of complex scenes. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, as a sculptor, I'm pretty open to, you know, what methods I can use, and what materials can be made available to make the piece sit perfectly in my world. And in this instance, the sound was recorded on the camera, fortunately, so the sound became part of the film as well. Moments, moments of compression of time being recorded, but also moments of sound, so it was like and then, you know, the aeroplane expanding out. Um, and uh, I suppose a sense of performance and a sense of event, they were all part of it. And I should say, as well as the process of manufacture, which was really a team effort, all of us working together yeah, and having object, dialogue about what it was a relationship between an object and a video work. So you've deconstructed the process by bringing it to a three minute moment or a four minute moment from what was four weeks activity. And for me, that is a kind of deconstructing of time. It's taking time and breaking it open and showing it in a split moment. And I think what that did is it compacted the energy that we all expended in creating the aeroplane again, or in creating that sculpture, I should say. Well, it sounds pretty good there. <laughs> and time lapse became the piece at the very end. It was never intended at the beginning. It was always seen to be a little moment that sat with the aeroplane. So you could see something of how the aeroplane was brought out. It was kind of giving you a little pot of history as to the process.
Well, I think it's important to say is that sculpture is very good at talking about mass. It's pretty poor about talking about time. And it's very difficult to actually try to catch process in sculpture. But film is very good at talking about time, not about mass. And it also is very good about talking about a process. So it's a case of putting those two things together. It seemed obvious that it had to be a film at the end of the, at the, end of the exhibition. Okay, let's, uh, let's go to the uh, next one. Turning the place over, uh, temporary installation. Um, a good uh, link into what's happening here. Uh, as well, Liverpool stint as European City of Culture in 2008. Hugely popular with the public and critics. And it transformed a derelict building into a must-see part of Liverpool. Um, I always thought it had an almost Tom and Jerry-like feel to it. You know those Tom and Jerry cartoons where they <laughs> cut a circle in the in the floor and then drop through the hole. Yeah. Um, and in this case, it was was it an eight-meter uh, dinosaur ovoid, uh, a huge opening and closing window, and then cut into the building facade. Again, you know, perhaps you could talk us through how that started. Yeah. Well, I was invited up to. I, I should say this idea was sitting on the back burner for about nine years. I had this idea from a piece of work that I made in Stockton where I had a facade made, or a bearing made for a facade, to turn that facade in one plane. Um, and through that process of model making and drawing, the idea for turning the place over came about. And it was only after I went and saw uh, Lewis Biggs, who was the director of the Liverpool Biennale, and saying to him, you know, look, you've got the European Capital of Culture coming up, I've got this idea, have you got any cash and we can put it together? I've proved with the other engineers that we can do it. It was only a case of finding the right kind of building. And in this instance, what you're doing is you're taking the discarded, the derelict, the forlorn, the written off, the rubbish of a city, and with the power of sculpture, you can bring a world audience to come and look at this derelict, rubbish, written off uh, building. I mean, how hard was it to persuade them to do that? I mean, it's one thing to make a model or a cat. Um, to, to go into an environment where, you know, obviously this is not an art work, an art context. You're taking a building that most people are thinking is, is it's an eyesore, it's derelict, um, and you do these extraordinary things to it. That can't have been an easy process. Yeah. Well, the first thing is that I, I was asking for a building that was due for demolition. So in that respect, uh, that was a way around the bureaucracy. You know, you couldn't just take a new build and say, I want to punch a hole into it and do this to it. There would be too much. The other thing is it had to be owned not necessarily by a private individual, but possibly by the local authority, because then they're in cahoots with the European capital of culture, and they could, see, they could see the mileage that could be gained out of having this as a piece to awaken people's memory of Liverpool and its existence, etc. because it was a bit of a flag-waving piece that we launched in 2007. So to actually get hold of the building wasn't too difficult. And of course, that was done with allies like Lewis Biggs and the whole of the Liverpool BNR team. But once we got hold of the building, suddenly the till started ringing because we discovered asbestos. We discovered a leaking roof. We discovered all sorts of things which we had to make good. And then there was pretty much a year and a half of bureaucracy where we had to legally take over the building and if anything happened, if that sculpture had fallen out and killed someone, it was down to us. And when the sculpture was eventually turned off, it was only supposed to run for a year and a half, it actually ran until the end of 2011. But the building has now been handed back to the local authority and it's still standing. <laughs> we'll see, let's see if we can, uh, there's a, some film footage of it I think. <coughs> Um, and while we're, while we're talking about waiting for that, uh, one of the things we talked about earlier was uh, the idea of, you know, your work, you make these major works, but they're always temporary, with the exception of, let's say, Slipstream. Uh, how does that make you feel when, obviously, something like this is hugely popular, there's a big outcry about, you know, it being switched off, um, it's still sitting there waiting to be switched on again, we talked about that, and how do you, you know, what's your thing? Well, it's also my frustration. The, Predominant thing here is that I work to commission, and the commissions tend to be predominantly in the public domain. That means you know, in outdoors, in buildings, or on the street. Um, when they are in galleries, it's usually because they're in a public space as opposed to a commercial space. A lot of these things are never, or in the current climate of um, the commercial world, I've been to the best you know, dealers there are out there, and they say they can't sell this stuff. So I'm not commercial, so I can only rely on the commissioning side. I disbelieve what they say. I know I'm commercial, and I'm proving it now. But basically, um, 
if you go into the public domain, what that means is that you know most of the public spaces that you work with have a program of events, and you are part of that programming. So I suffer from that. But on the other hand, working with architecture, and particularly with pieces like this, I think I'm animating something about the notion of the city as actually a very slow-moving event. Buildings are being pulled down, other buildings are being put up. And in fact, it's talking about the way architecture is this event. And if you make something, you want it permanent, you're almost destroying your argument about the notion of event. So you have to be very careful not to argue too strongly. The piece still exists, it could be turned back on. There's no plans to demolish the building. There are, there are problems of its location near to the confluence of three tunnels. So any power work is hindering it. So this could be bought by a foundation, and Liverpool Preservation Society are very keen at looking at that as a possibility with English heritage. Do you, do you feel that the slipstream, that you, you, you approach it in a different way, knowing it's a permanent work? Or do you, do you tend to think of all works being permanent? But they get I, I believe that everything I make has a permanence to it, but it's in the request from the commissioning body. And in, with uh, Heathrow Terminal 2, it was, it was established at the outset that it was a permanent piece of work. But then you've got to ask the question, what is permanent? And I've signed contracts on permanent pieces of work that operate anything between 3 and 60 years. And permanence operates legally in a contract that has that span. And so three years, you kind of say, that's not permanent, that's temporary. But then why is 60 years permanent? <laughs> yes. it's, it's, an, it's a kind of a, it's an abstract notion. And I suppose it's permanent if it's, if it's there until I die. <laughs> then it's permanent for me. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, move, we'll go back to the next set of slides, so if we can go into those. And but there's no reason why that can't run forever. It only needs a small maintenance programme and a tiny bit of money in the meter. There's, um, we, we probably won't have time for the other film that I've found, uh, but there's a great bit of footage which just interviews uh, 20 people and asks them for their reaction. But, and there was one, one I, just put, I wrote down, which he said, this is, a, this is a great piece of modern art. It's on a normal street in Liverpool, so the audience is huge, not hidden away in an art gallery. And it works. I've seen hundreds, thousands of people enjoying it, discussing it, arguing about it, and taking part in some, and I've taken part in some of these discussions myself. Forget the empty concept of meaning. It's easy to write deep rubbish about art. Come and see it. It works. Mm. You know, and I thought it's a, it's a great yeah. thing to say, isn't it? Well, I, yeah, in 2008, I was invited up to the Turner Prize that was being uh, given out in Liverpool. And I was late, and I jumped out of the train, ran to a cab, and said, quit, take Liverpool. And he went, oh, that bloody place. And I said, what's up? And he said, oh, art. you're not an artist, are you? I said, yes, I am. He said, oh, I can't bear art. Have you got any time on you? I'll show you a decent bit of art. And I said, well, I'm a bit late, but go on then. Where are we going? He said, I'm taking you to Moorfields. I thought, oh, my God. He's taking me to turn in the place. Oh, and he did. He drove me to my own work. Yeah. He said, that's bloody art, mate. That's your art. And I was sitting in the back of the cab, and he got out of the cab, and he ran around, opened the door, and said, you can't sit in there. You've got to get out and stand in the street. He dragged me out of the cab, and I stood there and went, yes, brilliant. <laughs> I didn't have the guts to tell him I'd done it, because he would have thought he'd got a right mania in the back of the car. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, this is a good link into the next one. Um, uh, when, um, I, again, I was re looking, we're writing a book at the moment on, on Slipstream, and, and I was looking at some of the uh, interviews about this project, and uh, it, there's a great, there's a great uh, conversation you must have had with Eddie Izzard, who was, was his sponsor. He was yeah. his sponsor. Um, and, you know, he's, uh, well, firstly, I'll just talk about how it came about, but it was a, a Delaware Pavilion uh, in Bex Hill. Um, it's a great one listed, I think, isn't it? Yes. Great one listed building. Richard proposes to put uh, a coach uh, on, on the top of the great one listed building. Doesn't do anything by halves. And uh, took his inspiration from the classic 1960s British film, The Italian Job. And Michael Caine utters those immortal words. I'll do my best Eastern accent here. He's, hang on, lads, I've got a great idea. Uh, when the red, white, and blue coach swerves off the Italian Alps and seesaws on the edge of the, of the mountain. And um, I, I thought it was sort of interesting way about that that film sets a dilemma about you know they have to save the gold they have to save them save themselves and save the coach, um, and you you replicated that scene I, again links into how the yeah well the dear late Alan Hayden invited me to do the second um, rooftop commission Anthony Gormley had done the first one on the terrace and I thought first of all I didn't really want to put a piece of work where Anthony <coughs> you know placed his. Um, but I went down there, I knew the building vaguely, and 
you know, I just thought, hey, this is where, you know, the land meets the sea, the sea meets the sky, it's all edges, you know, the building is made up of a series of edges as well as its planes. And so I was thinking very formally, having been sort of trained in the very, very early 70s at our school. So I started with a very formal level. But what you have to remember is that um, this was awarded um, Olympiad commissioning um, uh, status, it was one of the regional projects. And I started thinking, what we need to do is on this iconic building, we need an iconic moment that talks about the building, so the building becomes a pedestal. We need something like the coach in the Italian job, rocking on the edge, talking about the edge, talking about the building. What can I put there, like the coach? <laughs> and it was about two weeks later, I thought, bloody hell, it's got to be the coach, it can't be anything else. Because it's a cultural Olympiad project, or an Olympiad project, it's a red, white and blue coach, it's a flag-waving piece for our Olympic team. It's also, they were going for gold when they took that to Turin to rip off Fiat. Like our Olympiads were going for gold. So it had all these connotations. Also, it was a bit like the what-if situation. Am I going to win? Am I going to lose? And it's what artists have to go through when they're thinking about ideas. It's that what-if. Um, let's see if we can see. I think we can get it right. It's, this is number four on our little film clips. And... Uh, I found a little bit of footage of the of that famous scene, and we'll see Fantastic. if it, we'll yeah. see if it comes up. Yeah. In, in the meantime, one of the questions, which again came from the Eddie Izzard uh, interview, he talks about uh, what does he say here? He says um, the installation um, it combines a strong whiff of Britishness, seaside picture postcard humour, with the red, white, and blue coach flag waving for the Olympics. And it made me wonder whether you think <laughs> of your work as British, and you know, there is obviously humour in the work. Is it? Do you see that as a? It's an interesting question. I haven't really thought of it in that way. In this particular instance, it was very British and quite deliberately something like the end of the pier ride. You could say down on the south coast. You know, this thing seesawing. I mean, when I was a kid, you know, I was stuffed into these things and you know, rock backs and forwards. So it had a little bit of that. But there is, a, I suppose, there is a bit of Englishness in that it's the it's the kind of. Is in Bar Kingdom Brunel engineer meets the sculptor meets you know the structural daring, um, and they're, they're taking quite iconic classic it's a theme, moments. The theme of the Italian job where the bus yeah. dangles. I don't know how good the quality is, but hopefully you'll get a how would the you'll get a sense of it. To save their stolen gold, the Royal Society of Chemistry launched a competition to solve the mystery, and it came up with an answer, as David Shukman explains. I think there's a little bit of tongue in cheek and a little bit of humour as well, which is quite interesting. It's one of the iconic moments of British cinema. It, but there's also an eccentricity about, about yeah. taking a building and putting a circle in the yeah. centre, or flying a plane through a, a terminal. Um, you know, that to me has a sort of strong British kind of feel to it, uh, and, and that sort of slightly eccentric. It's like the little flag hanging out the gold, you know. It's, <laughs> it's a kind of a wit. Okay. okay, that's great. We're, we're going to the next. <laughs> um, it's rather cheesy. <laughs> and what was the public's reaction? I mean, what, what... well, it was terrific. I mean, uh, we not only had the sculpture there, uh, and hundreds and hundreds of people doing the, you know, classic googly uh, or Facebooking with it, but uh, we also had the uh, Mini Cooper Club of Great Britain come down. And they took over the whole of the car park. And we launched uh, the film on the side of the building for about four evenings over the period of the summer. Uh, so there would be these drive in movies, take, or the drive in to the movie taking place. So it was very British, it was very seaside, very south coast, and very Michael Caine. Very Michael Caine. And also, uh, with all Richard's work, there's this kind of moment where everyone's head has gone back at an angle, which I think, um, you know, certainly, certainly the Liverpool piece, this piece, the slipstream is unbelievable, and that will, there'll be a lot of people crip next when that piece is unveiled. Yeah. Um, okay, the last of the set uh, was something you've just been in the last eight weeks ago? Uh, this was, yes, yeah, something that I proposed along with the artists Satorsky and Satorsky are London-based, and producers of works as well as making their own stuff. And this was a concert that a group of us played on the River Thames as part of the Thames Festival, titled uh, 1513, A Ship's Opera, and comprised uh, a number of vessels, nine together, one light ship carrying a conductor, Hansman Biswas, uh, who's an artist, performance artist and uh, musician, improvising musician, 
and then a number of vessels that carried various artists, musicians playing uh, air hooters, three large vessels which <coughs> played steam whistles from a collection, and um, we had the Belfast cannons blowing as well. Yeah, well we're going to see it, but we're here, not see, but here. It was a half hour piece. in the middle of the River Thames and then on there was the Antsman, the conductor and he was calling for certain sounds to come from the various vessels over the period of half an hour with intermittent guns going off and fog horns and sounds that are very much to do with the sea and navigation and sounds that are meaningful utterances in that they were designed to save lives and let people know that you were there so they weren't meaningless sounds that one or two people had said beforehand. Okay, and, and it was also in part a way of taking back the river, you know, fighting the Port of London Authority. We've uh, <laughs> sort of killed him, and you won't see vessels on there anymore. I think what we're trying to do with this with this talk is find sort of commonality. I think we're beginning to see some links, aren't we, with the river and fighting everyone and, uh, <laughs> and you know, cricknecks and uh, salvage and scrap and the eccentricity and. I think there's a grandiousness about it, and one of the very common questions that I'm asked in, in these situations is, you know, why is everything so large? Why, why, is your, why is it that you like to work at a grandiose scale? And the only way I can really answer that is that if you're an artist who works with architecture, you've got to work at an architectural scale, number one. So you're working at the scale of buildings, but it also conjures up the question what is a grandiose scale? You know, it's like the notion of permanence. What is a permanent piece of work? It's only grand in the eye of the beholder. It's only very big in the eye of the beholder. I don't actually see them as very big. Um, I don't see them as big as tower blocks, you know, but they are grandiose ideas and they do need to exist in the real world. And the real world has these vast areas of water or vast areas of gallery or vast areas of facades of buildings that you can then play with. Well, at least it's nicely into slipstream. And, and in fact, it also there's another debate here about, about scale, isn't there? That, you know, there's this constant sort of harping on about uh, there's too much public art, there's too many large works, everyone's competing for the biggest work. But there aren't that many, actually. And if you compare it to buildings and architecture and bad architecture and so on, there's. You know, there's a lot more of that than there are lots of large, bad uh, public art projects. Um, and I think one of the things that, that Slipstream has been about, this is where actually we came in, Future City came in. We were asked by uh, Heathrow uh, to look at new the new Terminal 2. And there was originally an idea to put a huge landscape scheme inside the new space, which is about the size of the uh, uh, turbine hall at the Tate, Tate Modern. And uh, for some, all sorts of reasons, they decided not to do the landscape scheme. And we were brought in and we said, well, look, you know, you're the gateway to uh, London. Uh, London is a great cultural city. Um, airports tend to be in anonymous spaces. You travel through them, there's an anxiety and so on. Why don't you create some incredible cultural gateway uh, to go into the cultural city? And uh, unbelievably, really, I think back on it, we actually persuaded them to go down this route. And we ran an international competition uh, five artists were, were uh, offered the chance to make a work in which they had to take on the void. They had to take on this kind of huge turbine space and fill it. Um, and uh, Richard uh, took on this space with his team, CSI and uh, from, from Hull, and uh, Price and Myers, the engineers. And I remember they coming, we had this incredible two days where team after team after team of artists from Japan, from New York, and from the UK were coming in with their full teams and, and presenting to, uh, to, to Heathrow. And Richard came in, boxes were opened, overalls were put on, <laughs> things clanked and whistled, lights went on and off, and he won the gig. And uh, it was a, an amazing presentation. People still talk about how theatrical it was. Uh, and so the sculpture, um, well, Richard, you talk us through the sculpture. Well, the, the sculpture's titled uh, Slipstream. It's over 70 metres long. It weighs in at about 77 tonne. It's up in the air, supported off the columns that run down the centre of the covered courtyard area, and is uh, an event that takes place. It's a journey that takes place. It's an object that has been taken and has been thrown 
and creates in that moment of being thrown in the virtual world of the computer, it creates a pathway. The simplest way of describing it, if you take what we did here, is we took a, a generic model of the um, Red Bull Air Race aeroplane, the Edge 540, so it's a small stunt plane, and you throw that in the computer. It's a bit like if you threw it through the turbine hall at Tate Modern that was filled with clay, let's say, fictitious example. The hole that that would make as it tumbled through and then optimistically up and away at the end. If you imagine filling that hole with plaster, that shape tells you in plaster of its movement. And that's what we've made. We've actually constructed 77 metres. It's rather like watching a plane do that in front of you and you take a shot of it, but rather than do one two thousandths of a second click, what you do is you just go click and leave the shutter open for five seconds and the plane goes past. That trail it will leave is the sculpture we have made. I, I like that when I, when I, I think it was at the Slice and uh, you had all your models in, in the, in, all on the table and um, there was a hamster ball, a little plastic hamster ball, and there's a, a little model inside the hamster ball. And I love this kind of low-tech mix that, uh, that Richard has of rolling the hamster ball with the little plane in up and down the table. Uh, and creates it getting a sense of this kind of rotating, moving form. Yeah. And then it sort of turns itself into models. But then you get, a bit like with Butterfly, suddenly Price and Myers come in and suddenly all sorts of technical yeah. ideas are coming through. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, I mean, it's obviously a, a, a piece of work that has have some relevance to its setting and that's an airport that's where people have arrived from another dust destination or they're taking off from you know the capital city and they're going off across the world so the beginning of their journey is very different to where they end up um, and it is about that notion of going from a to b it's talking about that notion of movement and undulation which they take their journey as we leave here we leave a certain path as we move out of the stalls and round and down and out through the doorway and it's looking at that kind of sense of journey i was just thinking as well um what gets <coughs> interesting with richard's work and we've seen some of the previous projects has been this uh, you know the opera the orchestrating the opera or the, the, the orchestra and uh, we got involved in this and it was one day richard said well I've seen this particular plane, it's the Edge 540, and um, I, I, that's the one I want to use. There weren't any in Britain, and uh, we, I think it was one we couldn't get hold of. And eventually, you had to go to the makers, Zivco in, in, in the States, who are a kind of military company in a way. They, they, they are just make this particular plane, which is the best stunt plane in the world. And I, there I was on the phone it, it, with a guy in Nebraska, I think it was, trying to persuade him Utah, to let us yeah. use, let him use, our, use the plane to make a giant sculpture in an airport in Britain. You know, one of the more surreal conversations I know I've had. Um, but we got the, the rights to, the, to use the plane, and we are with it. We got Paul Bonham, the yeah. world stunt pilot, and we're going to see a film in a little while, um, which will show you that we reenacted the sculpture, or we tried to replicate elements of it. Mm -hmm. Scale, Richard. Yeah, well, these drawings, I mean, drawings done for various reasons, you know, to like observation, working things out, convincing people things are doable. And in this situation, I was copying an old Victorian idea of describing scale, you know, you used to get. The, the, the great pyramid of chippies with like you know the Queen Mary liner laying up on the side on the diagonal side of it and it's a way of talking about scale you match it and you hear these stories you know it's seven elephants long or five trolley buses long or whatever it happens to be in this instance it's sort of saying it's longer than an A400 Airbus but it's not as long as eight and one quarter trolley buses old trolley buses that is the actual length of it Right, so now we're going to run through some slides uh, of the making of the sculpture. And again, I'm going to ask Richard to just talk us through it. Um, you know, the great moment for us was that, I think, well, we won't have time to see the film, but there was a, a great moment where we arrived in Hull, we went to CSI's factory, and there were the doors kind of came up, these great clanking doors opened, and there were the three sections, three sections put together. And I just remember seeing lots, so many grown-ups hopping up and down. Uh, it was a wild factor again. The wild factor, you know, this was just three sections, and we... We're all using our imagination to imagine through, to multiplying it to the 23 sections. Um, but Richard, could you... Yeah, well, we're not too far away from the idea of the model aeroplane. Here, we've had to do a bit of bridge building as well, because we've got to span 18 metres between each column. But what you've got is you've got an armature of steel, to which you then have a set of bulkheads. You bridge across the bulkheads with combs or ribs. You then clad twice with plywood. And then once you've got that undulating form in ply, you then place aluminium as your skin, that's your surface that the viewer will see. So you're mimicking something of the world of aerodynamics and aero industry technology. 
And this gives you an idea of all the same. 23 cassettes or 23 bits uh, that string together like a necklace to make the one long piece of work. And, and here I think we have some slides actually starting to show it in situ. So um, again, it's been the most extraordinary project. Um, to, to work in an airport for all sorts of reasons is hugely problematic. To have 23 sections brought down on low loaders from Hull, I think it's six counties, negotiating the rights to get across each of the counties, going in across the runway at night, and then actually seeing these pieces brought up and dragged up into position, slung off the columns that you can see there. If you imagine that original photograph of the of the uh, atrium space before anything was in it. Uh, so we're going to have a look at some things. And it, 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 what, what, I think one quick thing really was the, the reaction of the, work, the workforce there. 2,000 people working in in um, Heathrow Terminal 2. And they have this uh, kind of motivational moment. They get Paul Bonham to came up, come and talk to them about flying the plane and his, his sense of whether this was a great sculpture or not. And there were 2,000 people in hard hats and high-vis jackets standing there with great slides of the work and then them going through and seeing the sculpture. You've just get, got a sense of just what it's going to be like. Yeah, it's been a Herculean effort with um, groundbreaking uh, technologies in the computer to sort of crunch the numbers to get this thing to exist in the real world. Important part. I'm sorry. This is the important. Well, this section. is the final moment when that shape tells you what it is. It's the moment where the aeroplane is rising up, and of course, it stops. And where it stops, that makes clear in the real world what it is. It's rather like if you had a bucket of clay and you put your fist down into it and then magically brought it back out. It would only be the knuckles that you would recognise because that's the moment where the hand stops, and that's where the imprint is left. Permanent. The rest of it is a movement. Someone, someone described to me about about love your work. Said there's always a postcard moment. Yeah. There's always a place yeah. where you can stand, yeah. where you sort of get the sense of the sculpture. So in the uh, 2050, it's going down into the walkway and yeah. going down to the centre. Yeah. Or uh, you know, with well, with this, we've, we're very uh, fortunate in that the audience and the passenger will be on both the ground floor, the first uh, level, which is the six metre level then the upper level of the 18 metre, and then you've got the two bridges into arrivals and departure. And you've also got a beautiful escalator that when we were first told about, we were quite annoyed that it should be in the way of the sculpture. But in actual fact, we'll give a prime moment of where you can rise from underneath and up across the sculpture and up above. Rather like one we're doing an aeroplane going through cloud, where you're under the cloud, you go through the cloud, and you come above into that other world of the sunlight. I mean, Richard, when working with Price and Myers and with CSI, what, what's the relationship been on the, in terms of making this work? Is it well, Price and Myers structural engineers, uh, as are also Commercial Systems International here, based locally in Hull, um, they have been absolutely vital in in realising this project. As have obviously Mark and his team at Future City. And everybody else that's been involved, I mean, uh, uh, Mark is here from Tommy making the film about, about the project, that this is one enormous team and everyone plays an, a, a very important, small, detailed part. But the, the real thing is obviously the engineering, getting the thing to stand up and not um, suffer fatigue over a number of years and to get it to stand up and to be made properly using craftspeople to be able to make sure that we get the best the best technology translated into materials so it's going to look really sharp and fit in the space. Um, and and I, my, my hat is doffed to them. Yes, it wouldn't have happened without me, so that makes me important to the project, but I can't do it on my own, so I've always spoken in the plural when it comes to this project. So we're going to see a, a very short film, it's about five minutes, and we'll just let it run, and then we can stop now and, and, and yeah. go talk to questions. So, Put this into context, this was never about a stunt plane flying and popping, it was Richard taking the object and rotating it through space. But what we did later was we asked Paul Bonham if he could sort of replicate the sculpture, almost as a challenge, and he got hold of an H540. We took over an air, uh, the layer strip up in, uh, in Essex, and he tried to choreograph what he thought the movements were. If you imagine with a stunt pilot, it's actually quite, uh, quite ball balletic, but this is not. This is spinning the plane and rotating the plane in a very unusual way. Um, and it was the most extraordinary day. But it was the key moment, I'd say it's a seminal moment for this project, in that Heathrow were there, 
uh, lots of the organizations working on the project there, it suddenly just kind of hits us that this sculpture was about a one-to-one -one scale plane spinning and rotating, and, and this is perhaps what it could, could look like. Richard Wilson is one of our most experimental artists, constantly challenging our perception of reality and order. In fact, he takes a childlike delight in taking forms that we take for granted and doing things to them we can't imagine. Of course, at T2, confronted with this huge scale, similar actually to the turbine board at the Tate, his reaction and his proposal was to take a plane and fly through that space, tumbling and weaving and spinning through the void. Today, Future City have set up an event to see if the manoeuvre is possible. Well, absolutely extraordinary day. We've been here out at the airfield and we've been witnessing the double world champion of the Red Bull Air Race, Paul Bonham interpreting something of the sculpture that we've been attempting to make in Hull. We've always wondered and people have always asked us, can anybody fly that sort of routine? Design and technology has manufactured it, but to see a real British pilot outdo even the model is just something stunning. The modern passenger wants more than an airport that is just to turn up and get on a flight. And it's really about bringing the architecture, the artist and engineering together in a certain way so that people can remember the experience of being in the airport. You know, of any static structure or object that's going to show movement, this is it. I've heard that 20 million people a year are going to pass through Terminal 2. The beauty of it is you'll have 20 million different opinions of, of what's going on, which is superb. So you put cameras on the wing, cameras inside the cockpit. We had another plane flying, uh, trying to keep up, uh, and, and cameras from the ground as well. <laughs> Just 16 turns. There was a moment up there where he stopped flying and was doing something else. It was weightlessness. <laughs> I'm a bad flyer, you know. I can watch this. I was going to tell them you were in the back of the plane. <laughs> <laughs> and there was one of the animations that we did right there. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, made in Hull. Made in Hull, go Hull. <laughs>
Um, it's around eight minutes long. It's it looks fantastic on a computer. I'm, I can't imagine what it's going to look like on the deep. Um, so from seven o'clock this evening and tomorrow night and on Saturday night, and do tell people about it and let's get as many people seeing this as possible. Questions? Does anyone have a question? It's done so <laughs> <laughs> we've, said it, we've said it all, haven't we? Go on then. It's um, probably very politically incorrect to ask you this. Um, I can only assume that um, just about every little boy wants to grow up to be you and a few little girls. Um, were there many women involved in your team? Because you said all these things are a team effort. Um, um, inter interesting question. Not equal numbers, number one, but yes, uh, members of the opposite sex were and are still involved. Um, certainly in terms of Future City, Mark's team, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly at CSI, um, in terms of all, you know, notes and that sort of thing being done. Mm -hmm. Not, I don't think specifically on the shop floor in the manufacturing side, but certainly on the shop floor on the engineering side, we had one, sorry, two female members on the engineering mm -hmm. team. Because I do think, in spite of the fact that when certain films come on TV and my husband's watching them on my son's, I go, boys town. Yeah. Um, I must say, <laughs> I, no, I think it's a very romantic themes that you have. there, and, and I think they would be close to the hearts of lots of women, mm. whether they've got sons or... Yeah, well, or I, I think what it is, is, you know, I'm one of five. I've got two sisters. Uh, they're both younger than me. I'm 60. <laughs> I, was, I grew up with Meccano. Yeah. I blame that, you know. I didn't grow up doing that. Yeah. My son did that. Well, maybe that's why I find it romantic. I've got a so, brother, I've got three sons. So I spent, yeah, I spent my time sort of tiny little nuts and bolts, which were big nuts and bolts, then, you know, <laughs> putting stuff together. It wasn't done strictly in that world of the computer. It's interesting, I was just thinking, my, my team, there's 13 of us and the three men, and, and, and this project I spent all the time on. So you know, there's, there you know, there's the Lucy's hunt. involved. Lucy's involved, but it, it's been almost that it maybe is a kind of boys and toys in, to some extent. And the, and I, I've, I've, I've sort of, it's been my personal project um, out of the office with there's maybe eighty projects running through it. So you know, there might be something mm. in that. But it's it's been a mixed group, isn't it? Like, really, you know, from marketing, graphics, PR, yeah. filmmaking. If you take every aspect of that project. It's a hugely complex organised uh, group of people from all ages, backgrounds, yeah. and yeah. You know. Another question? Hey, um, projects, collaborations uh, are often very synergistic experiences where the project ends up being sort of more than you expected because you're working with people with different skills and different outlooks. Uh, have any of your projects taken um, unexpected turns because you've been working with, with mechanics, with engineers, with architects, etc, etc? I don't think it's strictly um, unexpected, but when you're working in the public domain, let's say, public sector, public space, with teams of experts, there is a certain amount of compromise to any idea. Um, that might be budgetary in that we might, we initially were going to go out the building, but we couldn't afford that and we weren't allowed to do that, so bureaucracy also dictates. And the other one is technical can dictate. So money, money rules and uh, technical aspect are the three things that you have to work to. And it means however ambitious you want to be, you're always reined in somewhat by those three things. So you're never going to always get what you want. You know, I've given away trade secrets here. For example, slice of reality was supposed to stand right on the point where Greenwich is divided by the GMT line, as Mark pointed out earlier. In order to do that, that piece of work, we have to pile the ship into the river. On that GMT line where we'd sighted, we were actually piling down 
very, very close to the Blackwall Tunnel. We weren't allowed, we weren't given permission. We had to move 40 yards up or down river, and I chose to move 40 yards down river, so the pile work wouldn't affect the structure of the tunnel. I had to give in to that. There's no way I say, I'm piling, you can't tell me what to do, I'm an artist. <laughs> I have to say, I don't want to take that risk. I do not want to lose every asset I have breaking the tunnel. But I would say, you know, speaking on behalf of Richard, maybe, is that it, I think Richard is a brilliant artist to work with. I mean, we work with lots of artists. Most of our projects are collaborative. They're uh, multidisciplinary projects. And, and what I found with Richard is very open. You know, he's very generous. He'll, he'll open up discussion. People will, don't feel in any way um, constrained to make, a, to make some sort of uh, observation. They're bringing ideas to him within the, within the projects. And as new ideas come forward and, and new disciplines come into the team, you know, from Price and Myers, CSI, the filmmakers and so on. He, you know, I've almost childlike, I would say, in a way, in his kind of ability to take it on. But it always is still Richard's, and that's the key. It's Richard is at the centre of it. Mm. I don't think you could ever hope that it's always going to be your way, especially as Mark's pointed out. I mean, there it's an absolutely enormous team, and, and and it doesn't just work in terms of making making the sculptures. The, even things like. Sutton's PR might say, I want you here tomorrow to do this talk. And you think, oh, bloody hell, why am I going to do that over in da da da? And yet you do, because the payback it gives. And so you're all, you, on the one hand, you're there hopefully giving out instruction, but on the other hand, you're taking a hell of a lot of instructions as well, and, and people dictating to you. And you have to, and as a team and as a player, you have to do that. You have to be part of that team. You can't stand aloof from it. Uh, at the same time, you can't pretend it's got nothing to do with you, and you know you see artists sort of back off and lose control of the piece of work. It just goes off into other hands, and the aesthetic gets ruined, or it doesn't get enough PR, or whatever. You have to be a main player and, and be flexible. Thank you. Right, I've, I've got time for one more question um, because I am going to have to then off to do something more talking. Uh, yeah, Richard, I kind of know the answer to this, but. Um, why Hull, and, and what what of Hull is in the piece? And uh, just say a little bit about your relationship with the engineers. Well, why Hull? I I've known Hull for a long time, and I've known CSI, who have been based here uh, many, many, many years. Uh, they made a piece of work for me way back in nine. Well, we started in 1998. And um, that was for a piece in Stockton. And I had a very good relationship with CSI, and particularly Stuart, one of the directors, Stuart Green. And I met Stuart about four and a half years ago at this very college. Um, and we had coffee, and he said, it was such great fun making that piece of work. If you ever have another big project <laughs> coming up, do let me know. And they. Their bread and butter is predominantly curved wool manufacture. But in actual fact, the, the interesting aspect for them is that they do a lot of bespoke architectural work. And they build the things that no one else wants to build because not enough money, too many problems to solve. But that's what they like. Um, and it was about six months later that Mark approached me about being a contender. And I phoned Stuart up and I said, listen, how about your team thinking about an idea? I've got this idea. Do you think it's doable? And they said, yeah, we'd love to be involved. I then checked around a little bit to see if there was anyone else in the UK who could do it. I couldn't find anyone. And so I knew that if we got the gig, that it would be them. And when we got the interview, when we were shortlisted and we got the interview, we had two of their main people. Martin Cleanout and Stuart come down and be part of the team. And it meant in the interview, I became a bit of a Andy Warhol because I could just sit there and they'd ask me, like, how's it going to be built? And they'd say, Stuart, <laughs> Martin, you know, or how are you going to design it? Price of And it was able to, I was able to back those and get very, very sensible answers back from the people off the shop floor who knew how to make these things and design these things. So, yeah, that's been absolutely crucial. And it's meant I've had a relationship, a very passionate relationship, for the last three years of travelling up to Hull and working with the team, looking and inspecting the work, discussing problems that have evolved out of the process of 
tried to translate from the engineer's sheets of drawing to manufactured drawing to actual fabrication. Time on the shop floor with the workers, you know, all the guys who have been pop riveting and cutting and whatever. Um, and it's been, it's been fantastic, and it's been a learning curve for me as well. I mean, I've never made anything this big. I've made heavier. The ship is 104 tonne, 77 tonne. It's not the one that goes out to make a big piece, as I said about, you know, scale and architecture. But there was this enormous space for the 11 columns, and I've put a sculpture on four of them, of four of those columns. So in that respect, we filled a space. And, um, you know, it's meant I've been able to sort of get involved with, as I say, the company up here and, and have that relationship and, and follow some of those pieces coming down overnight. It's been a joy to be up here to be part of it. And I'll just add to that that um, the, the feedback that we've had from the, the installation of the sculpture in Heathrow has been that what CSI have done has been almost it was completely groundbreaking. You know, they had the, their skill to not just to, to make this work here, but then to bring it down and to, to sling it off the columns of that of that building um, and to make it work within this incredibly complex choreography of companies uh, also putting floors in, putting wiring in, you know, fitting out this enormous airport uh, while they had to sort of work between them. The uh, abseilers that were, were working to fill the gaps between the 23 sections uh, they've, they've, worked, they've almost had to develop their own technologies on, on some of the parts. Mm. Yeah. So they've, they've done themselves no, no harm. And in fact, uh, at a time when cities are competing for um, culture, for major artworks, not just in this country, but in mm. Europe and Middle East and so on, uh, a company like that that can do major, physical, enormous artworks, deal with the engineering and all the rest of the logistics, uh, it puts them in quite an unusual place, I would say. Mm. good note to end on. Um, once again, um, Mark, Richard, thank you so much for that. Um, and uh, we show our appreciation in the usual manner. Thank you to Hull College again for hosting us. And uh, one final reminder, or two, um, please do come and see the projection onto the deep this evening from 7 o'clock. And if you do have the opportunity to go to the exhibition area at the School of Art and Design, um, the Architecture Students exhibition is well worth a visit. Thank you again. <laughs>